August of 1969, film star Sharon Tate and four others in her Benedict Canyon home were savagely murdered. The following night, a few miles away, Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary were killed in a similar fashion. Two months later, Susan Atkins, who was in custody charged with the murder of rock musician Gary Hinman, began bragging to a cellmate of her involvement in the death of Sharon Tate. This major break led the police to Charles Manson and his family. What was to follow was one of the most celebrated cases in criminal history. Charles Manson and his companions were all tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. In 1972, the California Supreme Court overturned the death penalty, thereby making everyone on death row eligible for parole. What we are about to see is some rare footage of a recent parole hearing for Charles Tex Watson, Manson's chief executioner. Watson talks about the death of Sharon Tate. Not exactly, no. In what, what areas would you disagree with? Well, I disagree with uh, the fact that uh, Sharon Tate was hung uh, while I was president. Uh, he didn't say that. He said uh, while she, she was still alive. She or, was hung while yeah. she was still alive. I, I, don't, I don't remember that part uh, of her hanging. I don't remember that. You denied uh, hanging her? Uh, at that time? Yes, I did. Um, I haven't denied too much at all, uh, because uh, I'm guilty. What? I haven't denied uh, too much uh, of the crime that, that has been uh, uh, brought against me. I, I've, I've confessed to uh, uh, all of it, but there are some areas such as that that uh, I, I cannot confess to, because it would be a lie. I don't remember her being hung. All prisoners in California who are sentenced to life prison terms or in many cases those who have been sentenced to uh, the to uh, death penalty but in this state the death penalty has been overturned twice so all those people come before the parole board. Uh, as far as me taking the lead role uh, I was the male uh, at the crime uh, but at that time I did not consider myself a leader I consider myself more of a follower uh, of uh, uh, Charles Manson uh, and carrying out his orders. The epitome of that... Bob is Carter Manson remembers a Leslie Van Houten parole Rose. hearing. Uh, she said that she felt as though she failed the group. And I asked her, I said uh, something to the effect, well, you know, you guys slaughtered peop two people, you wrote on the walls and you did this and the other. What possibly could you have done that you didn't do? And she said... Something to the effect that she was told or she felt as though Charlie wanted her to take their eyeballs out and put them on the wall. Do you recall who stabbed who? Uh, yes, I, I, I recall uh, basically who stabbed who. Could you uh, elaborate on that? <coughs> um, yes, I could. Uh, as the records show, uh, I did shoot uh, Steve Parent uh, when I went into the uh, estate. Uh, I did stab uh, um, Jay Sebring after uh, he was shot by myself. Mr. Watson is very strong-willed. He is determined to do it his own way. He's been recommended by the parole board to do certain things. Participate in some, uh, with some mental health counseling and some programming in that area, and he has steadfastly refused up to the time I left the board to do that. And he has substituted his own program, which mainly is uh, working in the chapel, a religion that he has more or less developed himself. And uh, so he's a very strong-willed person. Charles Watson talks about his religion and fellow Manson member Bruce Davis. About the change that's taken place in our life, about what Christ Jesus can uh, do to a person and, and saving that person and healing that person uh, from the inside out. Mr. Davis is uh, a legitimate born-again Christian, uh, and we have a very good relationship. Matter of fact, we live together on the honor unit. Uh, he lives uh, five doors down from me. 
And uh, as far as our past, our past never comes up in, in the chapel, uh, in our relationship, or anything. Uh, we minister together the gospel under the guidance and the direction of uh, Dr. Stanley L. H. McGuire. During the time I was on the board, I was uh, impressed by the callousness and the uh, inhumanity that people could show to others, also by the repetitive nature of the process of the board. Hopefully, they will continue to, to appoint high-quality people who have law enforcement or criminal justice backgrounds, or have either been probation officers, uh, cops, or something like that, because things are so sanitized eight, ten years later when that hearing is held and this person is sitting there before you and they look just like Mr. Middle Class or Miss Middle Class, and they've had plenty of time to prepare, they have an attorney, and they've been coached, and the record is not complete and or you don't have the individuals on the board don't really have the time to go through every page of every record you kind of skim you do the best you can in the time you have to prepare and they can uh, mold the record to their advantage a lot of it gets lost in the telling and the retelling and in the as the years go by in 1978, I became the first district attorney in California history to attend a life or parole hearing. That was a hearing for Patricia Krenwinkel, one of the defendants in the Tate LaBianca murder case. I was absolutely shocked by what I saw at this hearing. There were three non-lawyers on the board. Patricia Krenwinkel was there, and she had her attorney there. She told the board that she was at the Tate residence, but didn't do a thing. She watched everybody else participate in murder. I had to stop the proceedings and fill the board in on what she actually did, how she chased Abigail Folger out of the rear of the house with an upraised knife, pounced on her in the front yard, and stabbed her 28 times. And I, I believe that uh, if someone's record indicates that from an early age, preteen or teen, and they have been assaultive, and they've been antisocial, and they have in, ended up taking a life or more than one life, that my only prediction is they will probably do it again. Charles Manson and his followers are all serving life sentences in California prisons, and all are eligible for parole. In August of 1979, in a neighborhood park in Jacksonville, Florida, Otis Toole and Henry Lucas met by chance and began an association that supposedly led to hundreds of murders. Henry Lucas was arrested on a minor weapons charge in Texas. Otis Toole was arrested in Florida and charged with arson. In the next few months, they began to confess to any and all murders that they were questioned about. Henry Lucas led authorities to numerous graves and freely talked about all the people that he and Otis had murdered. Most of the victims were strangers, had been tortured, and were the subjects of cruel deaths. Authorities believe that the victims were all sexually assaulted after death. Most of Henry Lee Lucas's victims were young females, as opposed to Otis Toole's victims, who were young males. Otis suddenly confessed to a celebrated murder in Florida when he told police that he had kidnapped and murdered six-year-old Adam Walsh. Adam Walsh disappeared from a Hollywood, Florida shopping center and was to become the subject of one of the most exhaustive searches ever. A short time later, his body was found in the Florida swamps. Adam had been brutally murdered. His death created national interest and led to the signing of the Missing Children's Bill. This case was instrumental in the printing of pictures of missing children on milk cartons and shopping bags and was the subject of two major films. Meanwhile, in Texas, Henry Lee Lucas confessed to more murders and led police to more grave sites. However, by this time, the authorities began to suspect that most of the confessions were fabricated. In Florida State Prison in Stark, Florida, Otis Toole, in his first ever interview, talks to Tom Heaton about the confessions, the death of his niece, 